Chapter Thirteen of Cabbages and Kings by O. Henry. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Eric Metzler. Ships. Within a week, a suitable building had been secured in the Calle Grande, and Mister Hempstead's stock of shoes arranged upon their shelves. The rent of the store was moderate and the stock made a fine showing of neat white boxes, attractively displayed. Johnny's friends stood by him loyally. On the first day Keogh strolled into the store in a casual kind of way about once every hour, and bought shoes. After he had purchased a pair each of extension soles, congress gaiters, button kids, low-quartered calves, dancing pumps, rubber boots, tans of various hues, tennis shoes, and flowered slippers, he sought out Johnny to be prompted as to the names of other kinds that he might inquire for. The other English-speaking residents also played their parts nobly by buying often and liberally. Keogh was Grand Marshal, and made them distribute their patronage, thus keeping up a fair run of custom for several days. Mr. Hempstetter was gratified by the amount of business done thus far, but expressed surprise that the natives were so backward with their custom. "'Oh, they're awfully shy,' explained Johnny, as he wiped his forehead nervously. "'They'll get the habit pretty soon. "'They'll come with a rush when they do come.' One afternoon Keogh dropped into the consul's office, chewing an unlighted cigar thoughtfully. "'Got anything up your sleeve?' he inquired of Johnny. "'If you have, it's about time to show it. "'If you can borrow some gent's hat in the audience, "'and make a lot of customers for an idle stock of shoes come out of it, "'you'd better spiel.' The boys have all laid in enough footwear to last them ten years, and there's nothing doing in the shoe store but dulce far niente. I just came by there. Your venerable victim was standing in the door, gazing through his specks at the bare toes passing by his emporium. The natives here have got the true artistic temperament. Me and Clancy took eighteen tintypes this morning in two hours. There's been but one pair of shoes sold all day. Blanchard went in and bought a pair of fur-lined house slippers because he thought he saw Miss Hempstetter go into the store. I saw him throw the slippers into the lagoon afterwards. "'There's a mobile fruit steamer coming in tomorrow or next day,' said Johnny. "'We can't do anything until then.' "'What are you trying to do? Try to create a demand?' "'Political economy isn't your strong point,' said the consul impudently. "'You can't create a demand.' but you can create a necessity for a demand. That's what I am going to do. Two weeks after the consul sent his cable, a fruit steamer brought him a huge, mysterious brown bale of some unknown commodity. Johnny's influence with the custom-house people was sufficiently strong for him to get the goods turned over to him without the usual inspection. He had the bale taken to the consulate and snugly stowed in the back room. That night he ripped open a corner of it and took out a handful of the cockleburs. He examined them with the care with which a warrior examines his arms before he goes forth to battle for his lady-love and life. The burrs were the ripe August product, as hard as filberts, and bristling with spines as tough and sharp as needles. Johnny whistled softly a little tune, and went out to find Billy Keogh. Later in the night, when Coralio was steeped in slumber, he and Billy went forth into the deserted streets with their coats bulging like balloons. All up and down the Calle Grande they went, sewing the sharp burrs carefully in the sand, along the narrow sidewalks, in every foot of grass between the silent houses. And then they took the side streets and byways, missing none. No place where the foot of man, woman, or child might fall was slighted. Many trips they made to and from the prickly horde and then, nearly at the dawn, they laid themselves down to rest calmly, as great generals do after planning a victory according to the revised tactics, and slept, knowing that they had sowed with the accuracy of Satan sowing tares, and the perseverance of Paul planting. With the rising sun came the purveyors of fruits and meats, and arranged their wares in and around the little market-house. At one end of the town near the seashore the market-house stood, and the sowing of the burrs had not been carried that far. The dealers waited long past the hour when their sales usually began. None came to buy. Que hi! they began to exclaim, one to another. At their accustomed time, from every dobe and palm hut and grass-thatched shack and dim patio glided women, 
black women brown women lemon-colored women women dun and yellow and tawny they were the marketers starting to purchase the family supply of cassava plantains meat fowls and tortillas decollete they were and bare-armed and barefooted with a single skirt reaching below the knee stolid and ox-eyed they stepped from their doorways into the narrow paths or upon the soft grass of the streets the first to emerge uttered ambiguous squeals and raised one foot quickly another step and they sat down with shrill cries of alarm to pick at the new and painful insects that had stung them upon the feet que picadores diablos they screeched to one another across the narrow ways some tried the grass instead of the paths but there they were also stung and bitten by the strange little prickly balls they plumped down in the grass and added their lamentations to those of their sisters in the sandy paths all through the town was heard the plaint of the feminine jabber the vendors in the market still wondered why no customers came then men lords of the earth came forth they too began to hop to dance to limp and to curse they stood stranded and foolish or stooped to pluck at the scourge that attacked their feet and ankles some loudly proclaimed the pest to be poisonous spiders of an unknown species and then the children ran out for their morning romp and now to the uproar was added the howls of limping infants in cocklebird childhood every minute the advancing day brought forth fresh victims doña maria castillas y buenventura de las casas stepped from her honored doorway as was her daily custom to procure fresh bread from the panaderia across the street she was clad in a skirt of flowered yellow satin a chemise of ruffled linen and wore a purple mantilla from the looms of spain her lemon-tinted feet alas were bare her progress was majestic for were not her ancestors hidalgos of aragon three steps she made across the velvety grass and set her aristocratic soul upon a bunch of johnny's burrs doña maria castillas y buenventura de las casas emitted a yowl even as a wildcat turning about she fell upon hands and knees and crawled ay like a beast of the field she crawled back to her honourable door-sill don senor ildefonso federico valdazar ruez de la paz weighing twenty stone attempted to convey his bulk to the poperia at the corner of the plaza in order to assuage his matutinal thirst the first plunge of his unshod foot into the cool grass struck a concealed mine don ildefonso fell like a crumpled cathedral crying out that he had been fatally bitten by a deadly scorpion everywhere were the shoeless citizens hopping stumbling limping and picking from their feet the venomous insects that had come in a single night to harass them the first to perceive the remedy was esteban delgado the barber a man of travel and education sitting upon a stone he plucked burrs from his toes and made oration behold my friends these bugs of the devil i know them well they soar through the skies in swarms like pigeons these are the dead ones that fell during the night in yucatan i have seen them as large as oranges yes there they hiss like serpents and have wings like bats it is the shoes the shoes that one needs zapatos zapatos para mi esteban hobbled to mr hemstetter's store and bought shoes coming out he swaggered down the streets with impunity reviling loudly the bugs of the devil the suffering one sat up or stood upon one foot and beheld the immune barber men women and children took up the cry zapatos zapatos the necessity for the demand had been created the demand followed that day mr hemstetter sold three hundred pairs of shoes it is really surprising he said to johnny who came in the evening to help him straighten out the stock how trade is picking up yesterday i made but three sales i told you they'd whoop things up when they got started said the consul i think i shall order a dozen more cases of goods to keep the stock up said mr hemstetter beaming through his spectacles i wouldn't send in any orders yet advised johnny wait till you see how the trade holds up each night johnny and keo sowed the crop that grew dollars by day at the end of ten days two-thirds of the stock of shoes had been sold and the stock of cockleburs was exhausted johnny cabled to pink dawson for another five hundred pounds paying twenty cents per pound as before 
Mr. Hempstead are carefully made up an order for fifteen hundred dollars worth of shoes from northern firms. Johnny hung about the store until this order was ready for the mail, and succeeded in destroying it before it reached the post office. That night he took Rosine under the mango tree by Goodwin's porch, and confessed everything. She looked him in the eye and said, "'You are a very wicked man. Father and I will go back home. You say it was a joke. I think it is a very serious matter.' But at the end of half an hour's argument the conversation had been turned upon a different subject. The two were considering the respective merits of pale blue and pink wallpaper with which the old colonial mansion of the Atwoods in Dalesburg was to be decorated after the wedding. On the next morning Johnny confessed to Mr. Hemstetter. The shoe merchant put on his spectacles and said through them, "'You strike me as being a most extraordinary young scamp. If I had not managed this enterprise with good business judgment, my entire stock of goods might have been a complete loss. Now how do you propose to dispose of the rest of it?' When the second invoice of Cockleburs arrived, Johnny loaded them and the remainder of the shoes into a schooner, and sailed down the coast to Alazan. There, in the same dark and diabolical manner, he repeated his success, and came back with a bag of money and not so much as a shoestring. And then he besought his great uncle of the waving goatee and starred vest to accept his resignation, for the lotus no longer lured him. He hankered for the spinach and crests of Dalesburg. The services of Mr. William Terence Keogh as acting counsel pro tem were suggested and accepted, and Johnny sailed with the Hempsteaders back to his native shores. Keogh slipped into the sinecure of the American consulship with the ease that never left him even in such high places. The tintype establishment was soon to become a thing of the past, although its deadly work along the peaceful and helpless Spanish main was never effaced. The restless partners were about to be off again, scouting ahead of the slow ranks of fortune. But now they would take different ways. There were rumors of a promising uprising in Peru, and thither the Marshal Clancy would turn his adventurous steps. As for Keel, he was figuring in his mind and on choirs of government letterheads a scheme that dwarfed the art of misrepresenting the human countenance upon tin. What suits me, Keogh used to say, in the way of a business proposition is something diversified that looks like a longer shot than it is. Something in the way of a genteel graft that isn't worked enough for the correspondence schools to be teaching it by mail. I take the long end, but I like to have at least as good a chance to win as a man learning to play poker on an ocean steamer, or running for governor of Texas on the Republican ticket. And when I cash in my winnings, I don't want to find any widows and orphans' chips in my stack." The grass-grown globe was the green table on which Keogh gambled. The games he played were of his own invention. He was no grubber after the diffident dollar, nor did he care to follow it with horn and hounds. Rather he loved to coax it with egregious and brilliant flies from its habitat in the waters of strange streams. Yet Keogh was a businessman and his schemes, in spite of their singularity, were as solidly set as the plans of a building contractor. In Arthur's time Sir William Keogh would have been a knight of the round table. In these modern days he rides abroad, seeking the graft instead of the grail. Three days after Johnny's departure two small schooners appeared off Corralio. After some delay a boat put off from one of them, and brought a sunburned young man ashore. This young man had a shrewd and calculating eye, and he gazed with amazement at the strange things that he saw. He found on the beach someone who directed him to the consul's office, and thither he made his way at a nervous gait. Keogh was sprawled in the official chair, drawing caricatures of his uncle's head on an official pad of paper. He looked up at his visitor. "'Where's Johnny Atwood?' inquired the sunburned young man in a business tone. Gone, said Keogh, working carefully at Uncle Sam's necktie. That's just like him, remarked the nut brown one, leaning against the table. He always was a fellow to gallivant around instead of tending to business. Will he be in soon? Don't think so, said Keogh, after a fair amount of deliberation. I suppose he's out at some of his tomfoolery, conjectured the visitor, in a tone of virtuous conviction. Johnny never would stick to anything long enough to succeed. 
I wonder how he manages to run his business here, and never be round to look after it. I'm looking after the business just now, admitted the pro tem consul. Are you, then, say, where's the factory? What factory? asked Keogh, with a mildly polite interest. Why, the factory where they use them cockleburrs. Lord knows what they use em for, anyway. I've got the basements of both them ships out there loaded with em. I'll give you a bargain in this lot. I've had every man, woman, and child around Dalesburg that wasn't busy pickin' em for a month. I hired these ships to bring em over. Everybody thought I was crazy. Now you can have this lot for fifteen cents a pound, delivered on land. And if you want more, I guess old Alabam can come up to the demand. Johnny told me when he left home that if he struck anything down here that there was any money in, he'd let me in on it. Shall I drive the ships in and hitch? A look of supreme, almost incredulous delight dawned in Keogh's ruddy countenance. He dropped his pencil. His eyes turned upon the sunburned young man with joy in them mingled with fear lest his ecstasy should prove a dream. "'For God's sake, tell me,' said Keogh, earnestly, "'are you Dink Pawson?' "'My name is Pinkney Dawson,' said the cornerer of the Cockleburr Market. Billy Keogh slid rapturously and gently from his chair to his favorite strip of matting on the floor. There were not many sounds in Coralio on that sultry afternoon. Among those that were may be mentioned a noise of enraptured and unrighteous laughter from a prostrate Irish-American, while a sunburned young man with a shrewd eye looked on him with wonder and amazement. Also the tramp, tramp, tramp of many well-shod feet in the streets outside also the lonesome wash of the waves that beat along the historic shores of the Spanish Main. End of chapter 13 Recording by Eric Metzler, Albuquerque, New Mexico, United States of America